Yep. Oh, okay. three x squared minus six x minus thirteen. Good. Three x squared minus six x minus thirteen. Can you do me a favor and change the original equation to plus twenty at the end? That's not going to affect our first derivative at all, but just change it to a plus twenty. And the second derivative, Anthony? 6x minus 6. 6x minus 6. Okay. And this wants us to determine where the second derivative equals 0. So set it equal to 0. Solve it. Okay. It's at 1. So I'm going to graph this original function. And something crucial is happening at 1. And I'm not, I don't have a great view of the graph, so I'm going to change the um, window quickly to make it, I don't know, negative 30 to 30. I don't think I need negative 10 to 10 either. Um, I just changed the wrong thing, didn't I? I meant to change my y's to negative 30 to 30. That should be better. Okay, good. So write it 1, which is here. That's a, that's a, I'm not going to use the word critical because that is kind of a definition that we actually have, but that's a, uh, an important point. And what could you say is happening at that point? Why is that? I'll give people a, a minute to think about this. What do you think, Bailey? Center. I mean, there's a word for it, but I can't think of it. Like the center of what? The, the middle of it. It's been shifted up. It's not on the x-axis. The middle of what, though? Like, oh, like the middle of the graph like, like it's this? Proportionate, yeah. Mm, okay, it might be. I'm not sure if that's coincidental or not. Matt? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's the steepest point as we're decreasing. So kind of in light of that example and the homework that we just went over. We have a negative slope here, but not that negative. And then it becomes more negative, and then it becomes more negative until it, it achieves its most negative slope that it's going to achieve. And then it, after that, it's still negative, but it's not. So like using whole numbers, it, it would be like the slope being negative 1 here, negative 2 here, negative 3 here, and then it starts to go back towards 0 again. So now it's just a negative 2 slope again, a negative 1 slope again, to a 0 slope. So yes, it is the absolute steepest part of that curve because it's the slope of the slope. Does that make sense? It's where the slope of the slope kind of has a, a, a maximum and that is your maximum slope. Nice job, Matt. Um, that's called a point of concavity, which we've talked about. So also to tie into that, prior to this point, this graph is concave down, right? And then after that point, because we're kind of, we're, you know, kind of bending out a little bit to turn into a concave up graph from that point after. Does that make sense? Okay. So we would, similarly to this, we would set up a number line to like we did with the increasing, decreasing stuff for the first derivative. Here, we're going to set up a number line. Our second derivative equals 0 right at 1. And then we're going to do this second derivative test prior to 1. So we're going to find f double prime of 0. And the second derivative tells us if it's concave up or concave down. Again, I don't care about the value. I care about positive or negative. So when you plug 0 into your second derivative, what do you get? Negative. 
So that should be concave <coughs> down. And if I plug something in greater than 1, like 2, f double prime of 2, what kind of number do I get? Positive. And so that indicates that afterwards, to infinity, the rest of the graph is concave up. <coughs> and that shows that, right? Before 1, concave down for the rest of the graph. And after that, concave up for the rest of the graph with your point, your, your point of concavity shifting is right here. When concavity shifts, it's really called a point of inflection. Okay? So we have a point of inflection at 1 comma something. How do you figure out the y coordinate that pairs with the 1? Plug it into the original. So 1 cubed is 1 minus 3 is negative 2 minus 13 is negative 15 plus 20 is 5. At a point of inflection, the second derivative equals 0. Okay? Under really one condition. A point of inflection is a point at which the second derivative equals zero. This part A has to be satisfied that the, a tangent line actually exists at that point. And we may or may not come across an example where a tangent line wouldn't exist at that point, but certainly if you look at this graph at 1, 5, we can definitely draw a tangent line there. So it does exist there. Okay? It will, yeah, a tangent line, it just needs to be tangent in that little stretch. A lot of our tangent lines hit the graph twice. I mean, even this tangent line is going to hit the graph twice. Eventually, it'll hit it when it's over here. But we just need it in that little stretch. Okay? So, in kind of light of that, I could see, and in what we did the other day, I could see where this number line business, when to do a number line, when to not, can get confusing. So, in light of that, I kind of added this idea to my little cheat sheet here. The first derivative test when you do your number line, this is kind of your number line test stuff. When you're doing your first derivative, your, your crucial points on your number line are where the first derivative equals zero or is undefined. And when you evaluate the first derivative, you're looking at increasing or decreasing in those intervals. So if you get a positive, that means increasing. If you evaluate the first derivative and you get a negative, that means it's decreasing. Once you jump to the second derivative, your critical points are potential points of inflection. And when you test within your intervals, if you get the second derivative to be positive, that means concave up. And if you get your second derivative to be negative, that means concave down. Is this making sense? Any questions? Okay, so if we jump to the bottom, determine the points of inflection. So immediately when you see that, you're looking for where the second derivative equals zero. So, how, are we, how should you go about finding the derivative here? What's going to be your most efficient method, Pooch? <coughs> Yeah, how am I going to find the derivative? What's the most efficient way of doing that here? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, wait, do what? Or the product. More efficient, I think, is distributing, right? Yes. Those are my two options, and the more efficient one would definitely be distributing. So my first derivative is what, Bailey? Um, 4x to the third minus 12x squared. Good. And then we jump right into our second derivative because we're interested in points of inflection. And that derivative is going to be what, Lizzie? Um, 12x squared minus 24. Good. And we want to find where that equals 0. What's our most efficient way of 
solving this, Catherine? Good. And so what are our solutions? Lauren. Good. So we've got our x coordinates for the points of inflection. We'll actually wait to see if those actually are going to become points of inflection or not. So we'll plot them on a number line. And explain to me what I do next, Amelia. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right, we take F double prime of something in that interval. So I'm plugging negative 1 into my second derivative. I think I'm going to plug it into this version of the second derivative just because, again, I only care about negative positive. 12 times negative 1 is a negative. Negative 1 minus 2 is a negative and a negative times a negative is a positive. So we're concave up there. And then we plug in 1. And so when you plug in 1 you get a positive times a negative which is a negative so we're concave down there. And then beyond it maybe at 3 we get a positive times a positive is a positive. So when it says to discuss the concavity, the, we'll give like intervals again like we did with increasing and decreasing. This is concave up from negative infinity to zero. And again from two to infinity. And it's concave down from zero to two. You should use that. That's definitely the more um, calc way. So I'm going to go ahead and say it's required on the calc. Um, so if I graph this, okay, so right at this, at zero, prior to zero, we're concave up. Agreed? The way that's kind of bending out. And then from zero and beyond, it kind of, or zero to the next inflection point, it sort of bends down, so it's concave down. You with me there? And then from there and beyond, it's concave up again. So I would say... To see this more clearly, this is more, this is concave up, because if it kind of continued that trend, it would look like that. And then this section is... Where's our other point of inflection at? Two? Two, yeah. So from here to here, it's concave down. Because if you, you know, kind of continue it, it would do that. Right? And then from that point to beyond, you can see that it's concave up again. Yeah? So, any questions on that? Oh, other than it just say find the point, does it? Does it say find the point? What direction is that? Find the point. So there has to be this fluctuation from concave up to concave down in order for that to be a point of inflection. Um, so it is, we just have to find the actual point. So zero comma, what happens when I plug zero back in to the original? Zero. And at two comma, eight times negative two, good, negative 16. Okay. Flip to the back. So, with this second derivative test, okay, and there's a kind of another way of determining relative maxes and relative mins, and this is it. We've already determined relative maxes and relative mins when we did our first derivative test and checked our number line. If it went from decreasing to increasing, it was a relative minimum, yes? But that's just when we were dealing with the first derivative and plotting that on the, on the number line. So there is one way of finding relative maxes and mins. We can use the second derivative for that as well. 
because if our derivative equals zero, okay, if the derivative equals zero, obviously you have, you know, something like this, this, could even, I'll throw that in the mix. If your derivative equals zero, in any one of these cases it does, if your second derivative is positive, meaning it's concave up, right? In which case is it concave up at the point? Here, here, A, B, or C? Thank you. At this point, is it concave up or concave down? Down. This is concave up. So if your first derivative equals zero, and when you evaluate the second derivative at that point, it gives you a positive number, meaning it's concave up, then this point is a relative minimum. If your derivative, that covered that one, if your, der if your first derivative is zero again, but your second derivative is negative, that means it's concave down, that would be here, then this is a relative maximum. And here, what would your second derivative equal here, do you think? What did you say? Mm, zero. Because I think prior to it, it's concave down. And right after it, it's concave up. So because that's a point of inflection, you'd get your second derivative, and you can add this if you want. If your second derivative equals zero, then it's not a relative min or max. Good. All right, jumping down to this next example, and maybe maybe I'll jump to the second one just because it's trig, and I know we skipped the trig one on the first one. The, the directions are very general. Find all relative extrema. And again, we could have done this a few days ago with just the number line test for the first derivative, but we're going to do it using the second derivative concept as well. Um, so we first need to find the first derivative. Derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of the cosine of 2x is negative the sine of 2x times 2. I think you missed that 2 there. So it's a uh, chain rule in there. So our relative extrema are going to happen where this is equal to zero, right? Or undefined, but it's never undefined. And this came up a couple times on the review, or at least once on the review sheet. So someone who remembers this, how do I go about solving something like this? Bailey? Wouldn't you have to do the I will eventually. That's going to give me points of concavity. But still with relative extrema, I'm, going to, I'm still going to try to find the places where the first slope is zero. And then once I know those places, I will evaluate the second derivative at those places to see which one it is, if any. But Jane, how do I solve this? You have to use a double angle here. So the sine of 2x is going to get replaced with 2 sine x cosine x, which will make this 2 cosine x minus 4 sine x cosine x equals 0. And now I can solve it by factoring out a 2 cosine x, which leaves me with 1 minus 2 sine x. So I'm looking for where does the cosine x equals zero. Right, I'm teeing it up. Two cosine x equals zero. So cosine x equals zero where? Good. And this one's going to give me where does the sine of x, I'm going to subtract one from both sides and then divide by negative two. Where does the sine of x equal one half? 
That's your first quadrant. What other quadrant? Five pi over six. Five pi over six. Good. So those are my potentials. And now, based on the second derivative test, I'm going to evaluate the second derivative at all four of those points and decide if my second derivative is positive, then it's a relative minimum. If my second derivative is negative, it's a relative maximum, which might be the opposite of what you would think, right? It's just so you know, like obviously negative is associated with a maximum in this case, so just be careful of that. But we have to go and find our second derivative, so I'm going to go back up here. So my second derivative equals, what's the derivative of 2 cosine x? Negative 2 sine x. And what's the derivative of negative 2 sine 2x? The derivative of sine is cosine, so that's going to be minus 2 cosine of 2x times the derivative of what's inside. So this will become negative 2 sine x minus 4 cosine of 2x. And I'm going to evaluate that at all four values. So starting with f double prime of pi over 2. What's the sine of pi over 2? 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0 minus, first of all, what's 2 times pi over 2? Just pi. What's the cosine of pi? Negative 1. Negative 4 times negative 1 is actually going to turn that into plus 4. So the point is it's positive. So if the second derivative is positive, is this a relative min or max? Good. Second derivative positive means this is a relative minimum. So we have a relative minimum. Yes. Oh, for God's sake, we screwed it up. We don't play that game anymore. Thank you, Jane. Um, negative 2 times 1. Negative 2 plus 4. It's still positive, so we're lucky there. Whew. Lucky break. Just about to reprimand you people for not knowing your values. <laughs> Except for Noah. Noah's was partaking. F double prime of 3 pi over 2. What's the sign of 3 pi over 2? Negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 2 is 2. Minus. And when I plug in uh, 3 pi over 2, what's 2 times 3 pi over 2? Just 3 pi. What's the cosine of 3 pi? Here's 0, here's 2 pi, here's 3 pi. So the cosine of that is negative 1. So it'll be negative 4 times negative 1, which will be positive 4, which is a positive. So again, we have a relative minimum. We keep going, f double prime of pi over 6. What's the sine of pi over 6? 1 half, negative 2 times 1 half, negative 1, minus, when we plug in pi over 6, what happens when you multiply 2 times pi over 6? 2 pi over 6, right, which becomes pi over 3. What's the cosine of pi over 3? No. Is it? Yes. So it, I'm just going to split this one up because it's a little bit hard. Negative 4 times 1 half. So that's negative 1 minus 2, which is a negative number. So that's a relative max. And then f double prime of 5 pi over 6. Keep careful, we're in the second quadrant here. The sine of pi over 6, though, in the second quadrant is still plus, so that would be a 1 half times negative 2 still. 
2 times 5 pi over 6 is going to turn into 10 pi over 6. 10 pi over 6 is going to reduce to 5 pi over 3. 5 pi over 3 is in the fourth quadrant. What is cosine in the fourth quadrant? Positive. So it's going to be minus 4 times positive. And what is the cosine of pi over 3? Because that's our reference angle. One half again. So negative 1 minus 2 again will be negative, And that's a relative max. That was a doozy. 2 sine x plus cosine 2x. Okay, hold your horses. Here's the graph. Here's our relative maximum, probably at pi over 6 followed by a relative minimum shortly after at pi over 2, followed by a relative maximum at 5 pi over 6, followed by a relative minimum towards the end there at 3 pi over 2. Good? All right, your homework. We didn't get to the sketches at the end, but that's okay. You should be able to brainstorm and come up with some of those. Um, We'll, well, no, we won't because you'll cheat. Um, page 195 is your homework.